Well, it's the same misconception I had when I first got started with Linux. I thought, um, well, this is it's complicated. It's difficult to work with. It's only for the mega geeks, you know, uh, like this guy. Um, it's only for uh, the the geekiest of the geek. And the thing is, what I found was it wasn't as hard as I thought it was, partially because, honestly, I learned a lot from Sean. I, yeah. Um, it's that 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 inspires me to teach because people get so intimidated. I'm like, look, if I can do it. Yeah. Yeah. If he can do it, anybody can really. No, uh, if I can do it, anybody can. And uh, I don't know if you find this to be true as well, um, but I found it to be a lot more fun than I thought it would be. I actually enjoy working with Linux. Maybe it's because I've been in Windows for so many decades. I'm just kind of got bored with it. But uh, I think Linux is great. Yeah. You know, one of the things um, I've taught a lot of times over the years, the Linux Essentials, right, which is mm -hmm. it's kind of a bare bones uh, certification. And in fact, I often tell people like it's the it's the certification that you probably don't really need because the certification itself isn't necessarily going to land you jobs. That whole entire course is just like this. Uh, this introduction to Linux and to get rid of that fear and that like, oh, I couldn't possibly, I'm not smart enough to get Linux. Mm -hmm. That Linux Essentials course kind of pulls that away and makes tougher courses like yeah. uh, Linux Plus or LPIC One uh, seem more feasible. So uh, those low level courses, they have more than just learning Linux. It's it kind of like, lowers yeah. the barrier to entry. Yeah, I think that's it more than anything. Yeah. It really like is like a launching pad, uh, you know, because that that learning curve at first is just straight up. Yeah. It's so scary. And, and so and people aren't as used to command line because we kind of got spoiled by Windows where you just click on stuff. I mean, you could do a lot with yeah. doing that. I was going to say they've helped a little recently with PowerShell. Now people yeah, are like, oh, yeah, yeah that's fine. Yeah. Just, yeah. yeah. But it's but and the UI is also very nice with with Linux. There's so many different ones now. It has, and I think that's part of the uh, confusion too. When people say, "Well, what does Linux look like?" I'm like, oh, I mean, and it, actually, it could be only text. Yeah, it could be only terminal. Yeah, and that's the thing because Linux isn't all those things. Those are like a GUI front end, yeah. you know, for Linux. Linux just being the kernel. That's like the the nerdy Linux thing to say as well. Linux is the kernel, and everything else is software that runs on Linux. Yeah. Um, but if you're going to use it as your operating system, it's going to have, you know, X Windows or Wayland or, you know, GNOME, KDE, all of those clicky things. And you're you're going to use things like Chrome or Firefox and all of those work on Linux. And I, I think that's another thing that uh, people get confused by. They think, oh, it's going to be completely different. Not really. <laughs> you know, I mean, it, Chromebooks are Linux. You know, people use Chromebooks and they don't ever realize they're running Linux. Yeah. So, you know. So I'm curious what, what your take is. Cause my my yeah. take is two, two of them, two of the distributions, because I was a beginner not that long ago, honestly, because I just dived into Linux this past year. Um, I mean, I've, I got to back up a little bit. I've used it for years, but it's off and on, and it might be months in between times when I touch it again. And you've done other things, whereas I haven't. <laughs> no, well, but, uh, but I really like Ubuntu. And uh, I think the desktop is also really nice, but my favorite, honestly, is, is Linux Mint. Yeah. Yeah. It's just uh, some reason, and it's just a personal preference. It's not any technical superiority that I know of. It's just, I like the way it works. I like the way it looks. I even like the colors in the terminal, all of it. I know you've probably seen some, I wonder if, if I influenced that because I, uh, those are the two that I recommend. Oh, uh, is that Linux, right? Yeah, and yeah. Linux Mint, Historically, it was based on Ubuntu. It's just a, like a respin. Remember, I said everything is a, you know, a GUI on top of Linux, the kernel. Um, and Ubuntu Linux uh, has all these repositories of software. And the Mint Linux was just like certain packages pre-installed. Mm -hmm. Although they also have t pulled away from Ubuntu a little bit. So now there can be just Debian-based Mint. Mm -hmm. So it's not based on Ubuntu, but Debian, which I mean, this is a longer conversation about distributions, but I have always liked those Debian based int or, uh, distributions like Ubuntu, like Mint. Um, kind of the other other side of the road, though, uh, it depends. I mean, those are my personal favorites. But if if your goal is to get into system administration in like the Red Hat world, um, it's a it's a different underlying package management system. And so if somebody is like thinking, well, I want to get a job, you know, administering Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, and I want my desktop to be like that, that's where Fedora comes in. Right. It's yeah. under underneath. It's it's a Red Hat based system. Uh, and if you're using Red Hat in your in your job, it's going to be more familiar. But yeah, I personally still prefer Ubuntu and Mint. <laughs> yeah. 
well, I kind of relearned a lot of Linux in the past past year. Um, so any the new skills, boy, I actually don't know if I can answer that because I I just kind of learned it all a lot of it in a shotgun blast, and I didn't really prioritize. So I would think that one of the important skills that someone needs to know, though, is uh, security, like permissions, um, and know how to set how to set those. Um, but otherwise, you know, I'll leave that to you. Yeah, I, I think my answer would be not Linux specific, honestly, because so much of the industry has moved to the cloud, right? And there's all these cloud platforms, but all of the cloud services out there are running Linux under the hood. I guess I should put an asterisk, you know, Azure has some Microsoft stuff, but most cloud services are running Linux. And, uh, you know, whenever I would teach DevOps stuff or anything related to the cloud, I would always stress that, yes, you can, you know, you can learn just cloud technologies and, and do your job. But if you want to be somebody who can troubleshoot when things go wrong, you want to know what's happening behind the scenes so you can figure out what's going on. That's where, you know, Linux networking and services like, you know, Apache and, and all of those various services that are now largely used in the cloud to understand how Linux does those things behind the scenes gives this uh, this like extra ability so you can get a job in DevOps and cloud based technologies. but with the confidence that when I click and point here or I do this API call and it doesn't work, who are you gonna call? It mm -hmm. can be, you know, your own psyche. <laughs> right, right, yeah. How, how important do you think um, knowledge of scripting is and things like Ansible, you know, and does it depend upon the depth that someone wants to get into Linux? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, if you're, if you're doing it as like your day job where you're actually managing Linux servers and not just cloud-based stuff, uh, managing those servers used to be uh, an interactive, I will update the server, but now we have so many servers that are configured, you know, in a world that DevOps is the standard, um, doing things like configuration management and, you know, automated rollouts and orchestration is vital. And uh, again, a lot of those are done with tools that have uh, developer uh, centric ideals and ways of doing them. But sometimes you just need to be able to write a quick bash script or something, whether it's going to be a long term solution or you want to test something to see, like, is this even a viable way of solving this problem? You know, if I can write up a quick bash script to do something and OK, that worked. Now let's come up with a more robust and, you know, fault tolerant way of doing it. That's usually how I work. You know, I want to like, OK, if I can make it work and then I can make it work reliably, well right. and repeatedly. So but, proof of concept first yeah, and then yeah. and then develop it after that. Yeah. yeah, I think it also I think it might also depend upon how much automation you need, I guess. And that's what you're saying. If you have lots of servers you manage, exactly. you really can't do it one at a time, you know? Yeah, and it used to be the case where we didn't have lots of servers. You know, right. we used to have one big server and that was all anybody could afford and all anybody needed. Yeah. You know, our, our compute needs were yeah. smaller, you know? And so now we need to scale that and to scale it, it's gonna be a tool. And what I like about a tool like Ansible is it, it's, um, it's far less developer centric and more system administrator, way of thinking yeah. uh you know I, i've done courses and they're i mean they're kind of defunct now not used often but like chef and puppet and, and a lot of those uh tools were developed for developers to write code to do things whereas ansible is almost like a, a an automated frameworked way to script stuff into action so you know if you it's, know linux it's ansible almost is powershell for linux kind of an idea I, that's a pretty but also, yeah. although you can use powershell in linux now too right can well, you? I couldn't, but oh, okay. <laughs> maybe, maybe is so. It, is it possible? Because like, my understanding is that PowerShell is expanded, so that it's not just a Microsoft tool anymore. I it's very possible. It and I mean, there are like Linux services in Microsoft, and I'm, yeah. the way to interact with that is PowerShell. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that, that was a really good way. I think Ansible acts a lot more like a PowerShell kind of thing, but for uh, for Linux. And, and yeah, it works. The nice thing is, too, you know, we started a conversation about distributions and stuff, but when you use a tool, that is designed with, uh, you know, multiple users in mind. Like if I write a bash script, it's going to be specific to my system. If I use Ansible, it's going to be abstract enough to manage whatever servers I'm running. So if I happen to be in a Red Hat shop, it's going to run the same. You know, I'm going to run the same automation and it's going to detect what the underlying system is. All of the actual end work is abstracted out. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And in fact, uh, it's, it's not something that is necessarily a part of the 
network automation itself. It's usually the thing that is automated because, you know, we'll, we'll spin up Linux boxes or Linux containers or, you know, whatever the, you know, the thing that's running usually runs on Linux, the cloud and everything else usually runs on Linux. And so it's usually um, just the flexibility and ease of use to assign and control the network aspects of Linux that make it uh, flexible enough to use in those automation suites. But uh, I think a lot of the like like building a network fabric or, you know, having all of those things, they happen at a, you know, at a switch or router or, right. you know, that kind of a level. And the, the Linux is just the thing that is manipulated to make those happen, usually. Yeah. I don't think it's as direct as what you would hear from the Cisco guys. You yeah, know, the, they do I mean, yeah, they they do that networking uh, automation and infrastructure and, you know, it's created so that the underlying Linux machines can work properly, if that makes sense. You know, I mean, it, they're the, the things that are shuttled around the various virtual networks and all those sorts of things. But I, and while I'm I'm positive there are network automations that take, you know, that are available to be done in Linux with Linux acting as a controller, apart from handling things like, you know, Kubernetes clusters and stuff, which is software based, a lot of the just pure network uh, configuration automation is going to be done on networking equipment. Um, I, my point was just going to be that, uh, you know, everybody is interested in getting into the cloud, you know, whether it's Google Cloud or AWS or Azure, you know, there's all this cloud technology and it's great to learn how to do those things. But sometimes it's even more important to understand that they're abstracted out, right? I mean, all of those uh, services that you're using have stuff underneath. I mean, it seems like magic, but somebody has to run those things underneath. And while sometimes it is just a service provider, um, sometimes it's not. Sometimes if you want to debug why things are going wrong when you're in the cloud, you need to understand what's happening in the cloud. Um, and sometimes you don't have any access to that, but just understanding how you know a Linux su subsystem will work or understand you know why, if I was doing this in Linux, would it behave this way? You can kind of debug things in the cloud. I don't like uh, teaching people stuff uh, where they don't know what's happening behind the button press. And that's oh, wow. where, yeah. That's so even if you're not planning to be a Linux expert in your field, uh, learning Linux kind of makes you a better um, person in, or better engineer, better employee in almost all of technology because it's so ubiquitous yes. in, in the technology world right now that uh, having even a basic understanding of what Linux is doing is just invaluable. Well, I'll tell you one blunder I made early on was when the cloud was fairly new. This is years ago. And um, I was using it on a consumer level for my family photos and my kids when they were little, you know, and all growing up and everything. And uh, my, my wife, she says, so they're all digital photos, right? I got a digital camera early on and all this stuff. So, so she says, well, where are all these, where are all these pictures? And I said, oh, honey, <laughs> you're going to love this. I uploaded them to the cloud and that's where they are now. And so therefore we can access them anywhere, any, anywhere we have an internet connection, it's going to be great. You know, it's like backed up and everything. She goes, oh, okay. Well, then I actually, and it synchronizes with my local computer, just kind of like Dropbox does. It was kind of an, wasn't Dropbox. It was an earlier version of a similar thing. And uh, one day I was doing some file maintenance and I accidentally deleted the folder that had all the kids' pictures in it. And uh, I didn't realize it at the time. I think it was, I realized it a day later, it's a couple of days later. And so I contacted the company and I said, oh, hey, I accidentally deleted this folder. It has all my kids' photos in it. And they said, oh, if you delete it on your local system, it deletes it forever in the cloud. And no cloud provider would do that now. Uh, but I, but so I, my blunder was I lost all of my kids' baby pictures. <laughs> oh my gosh. So uh, yeah, still married though. So still married, 35 years almost. Yeah, that's rough. My wow. long suffering wife. One of those with great power comes great responsibility. Oh my, oh yeah. my goodness, yeah. Uh, my my mistake, I mean, I've had a lot of mistakes. I mean, I, we could have like a whole podcast about mistakes, but um, from a career standpoint, uh, when I went to, uh, I'm showing my age here, but this is the, this is the old guy version, right? Uh, when I went to college, if you wanted to go into computer science, 
uh, you were a programmer. You learned C++. That was that's what computers meant, right? And so I went to Michigan Tech and I wanted to be in computer science, but I didn't want to be a programmer. I didn't want to be a developer. And so I started my career by skipping all of my classes and hanging out in the computer labs and learning how networking and stuff worked. Not an ideal path to a career, especially these days. But the thing that I, I regret is I purposefully avoided any understanding of development. I couldn't program at all. You know, I was a I was a system administrator and that was that was my job and that was the cool part and that's that's what I wanted. And now with so many things being uh, abstracted into the cloud where you need to access APIs to make them work or, you know, automation suites, even Ansible. I mean, you know, the ones that, that's the most system administrator friendly. Um, I've had to learn some development skills mm. much later in my career than uh, is wise. You know, I think if I would have started much earlier on knowing some basic programming, taking a few development courses for, you know, how to think programmatically, even if right. it wasn't language specific, yeah. uh, it, I would have had a lot easier time adjusting to what the world is now. Mm -hmm. so. I would agree with that, too. I mean, and I still have never gotten much into uh, development or coding or anything like that. I just, um, you know, scripts are pretty much the limit of what I'll do. And even those, a lot of times, there's so much res there's so many resources out there. All you got to do is Google and find a script that has what you want and then put the name of your own machines in or you, you customize it to your own needs. But uh, I would have done better if I had done a little bit more coding and gotten, there's a mentality with it. There's a flow of logic yeah, and everything. Yeah, yeah, that would have that would have helped me because I'm kind of scattered anyway, you know, and and um, so that would have kind of maybe help rein me in a little bit. <laughs> but yeah, that's the that's the one regret, you know, and and I've had to learn uh, some. I mean, I've written quite a bit of software now. Um, unfortunately, it's not great software because I don't have those fundamentals on how to write good software. So I write software that does what I need it to do, mm -hmm. but it's not something that could ever be exposed to uh, the Internet. I mean, I, I because I don't have that mindset of how to be secure when I'm programming and how to you know do any of the, the proper ways of doing it. And while, yes, I could brag, I'm like, I'm such a scrappy programmer. I don't make great code. <laughs> well, and I think I think that kind of goes to the mistake that a lot of us make in IT is we kind of get pigeonholed into one specialty or something and just because of a lot of things, you know, time and family, and I gotta get to my kid's baseball game, and I don't really have time to study another topic that's not really directly related to what my job is today. Uh, but man, it really it really helps to uh, expand your capabilities, your horizon, your thinking. You can participate in a lot of other conversations that you wouldn't be able to otherwise. And that's big an advantage of working at CBT Nuggets. We have people, great people with so many different good specialties and they're so ex such experts at it yeah. that uh, we get a lot of exposure to that stuff. Yeah, and if you remain curious about those things, I mean, if you remain curious, if it's not even in your current uh, venue of what your job responsibilities are, but you're curious and you want to know about different trends, most of them are not going to have any impact on your day to day. But you're going to find that one thing occasionally, like, oh, you know what, I could use this to make my life better, or I could use this thing in a way that people aren't even thinking because you have different experiences. Mm -hmm. So the more that you can uh, learn about stuff that even isn't in your zone. Mm -hmm. I mean, you started learning a, a lot more about Linux than you ever did before, and I'm sure that that has changed how you do every aspect yeah. of your, you know, your IT stuff. Yeah, it makes a big difference, yeah. And it makes it more enjoyable too. When you get some more variety, you don't get too stale in a specific thing, you know? Yeah. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from CBT Nuggets. Also, if you're new to IT or are interested in an IT career, visit cbtnuggets.com and sign up for a free trial.